Ben, can you hear me? Uh, I, I can hear you. Hello. Uh, pleased to meet you. Bye -bye. And uh, uh, thank you again for, for joining us. Uh, two of uh, my co-chairs are here, uh, Hélène and uh, Geraldine. Hello. And uh, Robin should join us very soon. Uh, but we are very, very happy to uh, have, you, have you today. And uh, we just would like to check uh, if you will use uh, PowerPoint, the screen sharing process. So if you can uh, share them, just to check that everything is all right. Of course. Uh, but I think you need to give me uh, you know, the ability to share, because I don't think I have that at the moment. Uh, you, have, you have disabled participant sharing. I just did it, so it okay, should okay, be fine. Okay, let's see. Uh, so I think, can you, can you see my slides? Yes, this is perfect. Yeah. Good. Perfect. Yes. And uh, so what I propose you is that, so we'll start right on time at 10. Uh, uh, we are already recorded, yes, yes. Uh, already, but in the version we will put online, all this phase will be removed. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, but I will uh, say to all participants that if they don't want to appear, uh, they just need to switch off their, their, their camera. Sure. Uh, yeah, but uh, everything will be uh, recorded. Sure. Uh, so I don't know if you have any questions or wishes or if everything is fine. No, I guess one question is, I mean, after, so I, you know, I'll, I'll aim for those 45 minutes and, and what about the Q and A? Will people be asking directly or will they send their questions via chat or how, how are we going to do it? Some people will ask the questions with the chat. Others will go through the mediation of Hélène who is uh, with us because they want to talk and become uh, present and be, be visible. I think there will be the two modalities sure. at the end. Uh, but this will be, I know it would be frustrating, but this will be 15 minutes sharp because uh, we have to be very strict uh, about uh, the, the process. <laughs> um, and uh, what I propose is, uh, so at 10, uh, I will just say very quickly a couple of introductory words uh, to the participants but, uh, and about you. But, 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 but I presume you mean nine rather than 10. Oh, yes, sorry. Yes, yes, yes. good. Sorry. <laughs> yes, yes, sorry. Um, so this will be very short, uh, 40 seconds, uh, not, sure. not more. And uh, so we still have uh, seven minutes. So let's wait. And uh, there will be probably people coming during your talk. Automatically, mm -hmm. their mics will be switched off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We'll check it. Uh, I've written in the chat system that people should mute their, their mic, but at the beginning, if everybody can be visible and just switch on the camera, become uh, present, and then switch it off, uh, that's what I will propose. It will be better for the conviviality of the. For sure. Mm -hmm. Very good. And, and, and would you prefer me to, to stop sharing so that you can appear full screen or should I just keep the, uh, the shared screen on? Maybe if, uh, if it's fine uh, with you, uh, we can activate the sharing just after the introduction. Sure. Uh, yes, this would make that uh, everybody will be visible for everybody. Sure, sure. Hello. Many people we know already. Hello, Vendelin. Hello, Ro. Hello, Michael. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Welcome. Hello, hello. So no, no regrets for, for Paris. This is a very gray and, and sad day. So, yeah, no, no regrets. <laughs> In a way, it's better online. <laughs> So uh, just before introducing everything, for those who, who want to contribute to a collaborative report, uh, I have inserted 
what we call a PAD, it's a collaborative report. Uh, there is already the structure of the program inside it. Uh, so if you want to put some summaries, uh, comments, do not hesitate. Uh, we will share it on social media. And it's also a way to keep uh, an archive, a written archive of this uh, uh, discussion. So it's inside the chat system. Do not hesitate if you want to write something. You will see as soon as you will start typing something, you will have a color. So each of you will have a specific color. And then you can give a name, your name, your real name, or a fantasy name to this color. Or you can remain anonymous. So it's, uh, we hope it will be a beautiful rainbow uh, at the end. Uh, let's see. Hello, welcome. Welcome, Lucy. Hello. Welcome, bienvenue. So I just checked uh, the registrations, and uh, we have a lot of people from the Scandinavia, uh, okay. in particular from Sweden, uh, <laughs> who join us today. Many people from Sweden. Wonderful. So welcome. And, and just a, a minor issue, please. Uh, it's a message for everybody. Please do not share the Zoom links on social media uh, because we did it for some recent events and uh, you know what happened. Uh, some strange people suddenly came or boats, Russian boats, uh, doing strange songs and etc. So please, <laughs> it's not, I, I didn't secure the session. There is no code to make it uh, as simple as possible to, to manage. So please do not put it on Facebook, the links, uh, please. Hello, Pierre, welcome. <clears throat> Hello, Gazi, welcome. Hello, Mark. Hello. Welcome. Thanks.
So, uh, hello everybody. Uh, welcome for this fourth uh, Dauphin uh, Phenomenology uh, workshop. Uh, please, uh, as you know, uh, this event is recorded. So, uh, after this short introduction, if you don't want to appear uh, in, on the video, uh, simply switch off your, your camera. Uh, this, what I'm saying now will not won't be part of the uh, recording, but uh, very soon it will be recorded in uh, 30 seconds. So please uh, do not activate your camera if you don't want to appear. Uh, so this uh, fourth Dauphin Phenology Workshop will be about the experience of commons. Uh, you will have great panels, great keynotes, great presentations on uh, these topics. I'm uh, extremely pleased uh, and uh, honored uh, to welcome today Professor Dan Zervi, who is professor at the University of Copenhagen and uh, also at uh, the University of Oxford. Uh, he writes on phenomenology, especially the philosophy of Edmund Husserl and uh, philosophy of mind in his writing. He has dealt extensively with topics such as self, self-consciousness, intersubjectivity, and social cognition. He is the co-editor of the journal Phenomenology and the Cognitive Sciences. Uh, his work has been translated into more than 30 languages. Uh, we all had the opportunity during our last two events to talk about his, his great book, the great book he co-edited, the Oxford Handbook of the History of Phenomenology, extremely useful uh, and clear uh, handbook. So again, I'm pleased and uh, honored to welcome you and uh, we look forward to listening to your talk. Thank you so much. So let me try to uh, to share my my screen. Uh, and, and again, just as a preliminary, I mean, thanks so much for the for the invitation. Uh, um, it's a pity that I couldn't be <laughs> in Paris, but I guess the majority of the other participants are not there either. So we are all kind of joining in on, on Zoom. So what I want to talk about today is uh, intersubjectivity, sociality, community. And I just need to get my stream working. So the capacity to uh, engage in collective intentionality and to jointly be directed at objects and goals is a key aspect of human sociality. We can enjoy a sunset, solve a task, we can make plans for the future together can also share collective identities, responsibilities, traditions, and customs. And over the last few decades, there has been a lot of interest in the issue of collective intentionality from a variety of different disciplines, not just philosophy, but certainly also psychology, economics, neuroscience. And there has been a tendency uh, in all of this empirical work uh, to uh, draw on uh, uh, philosophical work done by a small group of analytic philosophers, including primarily uh, Searle, Bradman, Gilbert, and uh, Tumula. Now, if one looks at their contribution, um, I think it's fair to say that uh, it has primarily been uh, focusing on an exploration of joint action Many of the examples, the kind of paradigmatic examples that are being discussed concerns the question of how is it possible to say, go for a walk together, paint a house together, make food together. And the big question that has been, in, then been discussed is basically the question of whether collective intentions of this kind can somehow be reducible to individual intentions or whether we need to accept the uh, existence of irreducible we intentions. Now, I think Searle uh, plays a certain particular role um, among these figures because he's often praised as the person who really introduced the topic of collective intentionality into the contemporary debate. And it's interesting to compare his early work, Intentionality, to uh, the later work, uh, The Construction of Social Reality, because we are see in the first a book were really focusing on individual intentionality. He later, 12 years later, really takes up the question of collective intentionality. Now in the preface to the construction of social reality, uh, Sir remarks that 
earlier figures, uh, uh, what he calls the philosopher sociologists of the early 20th century, that they, did, they didn't really have the tools to tackle the question of we intentionality. And that, of course, is what Searle thinks he, he has, primarily because he has been doing work on individual intentionality. But what is a bit odd with this uh, listing is that uh, Sir doesn't mention the name of uh, Alfred Schütz. And of course, if one goes to Schütz's most famous work, uh, The Sinnhafte Aufbau der Sozialen Welt, uh, one will not just be struck by the fact that that title bears a striking similarity to the, the title of Searle's own book. But of course, what Schütz was trying to do in that uh, book was precisely to link uh, phenomenological investigations of intentionality to uh, fundamental problems in uh, sociology. And Schütz was not the first one to do that. In fact, in phenomenology per se, a lot of figures have actually invested uh, you know, time and resources on exploring the question of collective intentionality. And funnily enough, if one goes back to Husserl's work, one will actually find a somewhat parallel development uh, uh, to the one that Searle has uh, gone through in the sense that Husserl in logical investigations were primarily focusing on individual intentionality. And then uh, a little more than a decade later, for instance, in Ideas 2, we're really uh, kind of struggling with trying to understand uh, not just uh, empathy and uh, intersubjectivity, but also communal uh, life. And so what one can see, and this is primarily what I want to spell out in the talk today, what one can see in many of these terminologies is that they start out by having an interest in uh, intentionality. Then they move on to investigate the dyadic relationship between you know, uh, pairs, and then using that as a platform, they proceed to investigate larger group formations and communal experiences. And here's just a quick overview. I mean, so, so just to make it clear that we're not, just, we're not just talking about, you know, a single book or a few books. There's actually a whole, a whole series of, of uh, I think, important contributions by Husserl, Reinhardt, Scheler, Stein, Walter, Schütz, Gurwitsch, to just mention a few of them. Uh, so there's a lot of resources, I think, to be explored. And I'm going to talk about some of these figures uh, in, in what follows. So let's start with Husserl uh, and Husserl's uh, kind of early investigation of empathy. And I just want to say a few words about what Husserl means by empathy, since this will be of importance for what is going to follow. So Husserl uses the term empathy, Einfühlung, basically as a synonym for other experience. So instead of talking about Einfühlung, he often talks about uh, Fremderfahrung, other experience. And here's a quote from Ideas 2. Empathy is not a mediate experience in the sense that the other would be experienced as a psychophysical annex to his corporal body, but is instead an immediate experience of the other. So empathy is this immediate experience of the other. And as he continues in Sophomologie der Intersubjektivität 2, it would be countersensical to say that it, that is foreign subjectivity, is inferred and not experienced when given in this original form of empathic presentation. For every hypothesis concerning a foreign subject already presupposes the perception of this subject as foreign and empathy is precisely this perception. So it's important to understand that empathy is not about pro-social behavior, it's not about compassion, it's really about how to understand and encounter the other in a very kind of fundamental experiential manner. Husserl talks about how empathy, how we in empathy kind of transcends ourselves, how empathy allows us to encounter something new and other in a kind of radical manner. And what is particularly important, and I mean this again will be of importance to what is what follows, is that what I'm encountering in empathy is not merely another object, it's really another intentional subject. And one way to highlight that 
is by uh, you know uh, uh, attending to the fact that that when I'm empathizing with somebody, I'm not just so to speak ending my intentional ray in that other person. If I'm, for instance, empathizing with somebody who is uh, uh, happy, I mean, typically what my attention will will focus on is whatever it is that that person is happy about, or if the person is sad, it's not just, a, I'm just not, I'm not simply encountering somebody who is sad, I'm encountering somebody who is sad about something in the world. And I'm kind of sharing in, in a specific sense, the author's kind of perspective on that world. Okay, this is for now, all I want to say about Husserl, I'm going to return to him later on. What I want to continue with is to take a quick look at how Sheila is basically taking on some of these uh, ideas and developing them further. What we will find in, uh, in one of Scheler's main works, Wiesn und Formen der Sympathie, is basically a differentiation between different forms of emotional uh, relatedness. And so what Scheler proceeds to do is to distinguish the following phenomenon. First, emotional contagion, German Gefühlsansteckung, Example would be, you know, imagine that you are in a kind of neutral mood, you kind of enter a bar and you're kind of infected by the mood that is present in that crowd. It becomes your own mood. Likewise, this is another example of Sheila. You're walking on the street and you pass as a funeral procession and you're kind of struck by the kind of solemn mood of, of the crowd. So this is one phenomenon that has to be distinguished from empathy or what Sheila calls fremde Wahrnehmung, the perception of others. So this is a perceptually based understanding of other. Now I am, I'm not just, to, so in contrast to emotional contagion where it's about me now having a specific emotion in empathy, it's about me recognizing the emotional state of the other. That has to be distinguished again from sympathy or mitgefühl now I'm not just recognizing that somebody else is in a specific state, I'm also responding emotionally to that. For instance, I mean, if somebody is distressed, I might feel concerned about that person and perhaps be motivated to help the person in question. And finally, uh, there is what uh, Sheila calls uh, mit ein anderfühlen or emotional sharing. So this is the situation where I'm not just having a, an experience of my own or nor am I simply recognizing that somebody else is having a certain emotion. No, in this specific case, it's about me experiencing a certain emotion as ours together with somebody else. So for instance, I, you, one example could be you are, you are a member of a sports team, you win, you win the match and you're feeling collective joy. So this is not just you feeling joy, it's you experiencing us being joyful over the, uh, the, the victory. Now, this is all kind of focusing on specific types of emotional kind of relation. What is interesting then is that Scheler in a, a later work, the Formalismus in the Ethik, basically argues that these different types of relatedness can actually illuminate different types of group formations. And so what he proceeds to do, and he actually argues that part of the task of philosophical sociology is to develop a theory of these different social formations. And what he then proceeds is to distinguish different group formations. He argues that a very kind of primitive form of group formation is the crowd or mass. He argues that the kind of leading principle here is a kind of contagion, a kind of imitation. And, and interestingly, he says that at that level, we, we do not yet, uh, we are not yet dealing with a proper we. Then he uh, goes on to say, uh, or to say that something that he calls life community. This is, a, this is exemplified by kind of family life or tribal life or the life of a clan. Uh, we don't really have a very, dis a kind of very articulate individuality. We are primarily you know, identified as the group members that we are. And he talks about this as exemplifying a certain organic living with one another. 
Then he distinguishes what he calls uh, Gesellschaft, society, arguing that this is a form of social formation where we are really employing inferential processes of trying to figure out what others are thinking about or what they are, uh, what kind of preferences they have. And like many of the other phenomenologists, and this is picking up a distinction uh, originally employed by Ferdinand Tunis, uh, uh, Sheila wants to say that society or Gesellschaft that, that this is uh, to some extent a, a fairly kind of instrumental way of engaging with others. And then finally, he talks about uh, what he calls the personal community. This is exemplified by a way of being together with others uh, where there is solidarity, there is trust, there is reciprocity, and there is also emotional uh, sharing in the full sense of the term. So, I mean, one comment, one further comment is needed. Sheila is saying that this, this, you know, hierarchy of different types of group formations, he's kind of making clear that he doesn't think that it's a historical correct description as if we all started by being members. I mean, or not we, but I mean, mankind started with being parts of a mass and then they became parts of a life community and then a, a, a society, because as he says, in, in, in any historical concrete type of group, there will always be a certain mixture of these different forms. But he still argues that there is a certain founding, founded relationship obtaining between them. And the specific claim he makes is that society, this kind of analogical inferential, instrumental way of engaging with others must always be a latecomer. It somehow presupposes a more natural, spontaneous, uh, uh, primitive form of understanding uh, one another. And as he says, you know, all possible society is founded through, you know, life community. But the important point, and again, it will be clear later on why this is important. The important point is that by looking at different types of interpersonal understanding, we can throw light upon different types of group formations. Then let's move on to Gerda Balter, who wrote a dissertation called, uh, you know, a, a contribution to the ontology of social communities, which is one of the most extensive explorations, from logical explorations of community. And just like Sheila, she also distinguishes between societies and communities. Gesellschaft and Gemeinschaft, arguing that Gesellschaft is this aggregation of individuals who are, who are merely instrumentally related to one another, whereas communities are bound by uh, bonds of solidarity, and there is a we, uh, a we feeling occurring between the members. Now, one obvious question to ask is, what is it that allows for this communal being together? What is it that is somehow in common between uh, these members. And Walter is saying that it's not sufficient to have the same kind of intentional state, the same kind of intentional object, and even being physically interacting. And the kind of example she has is imagine a group of workers who are all collaborating on building a house together but who are all somewhat suspicious of each other. So even though they are all doing the same things, they all have the same kind of intentional state. They are aiming at building the house. They are all focusing on the same blocks of, of uh, concrete. I mean, given the fact that there is this uh, suspicion between them, I mean, we are, we are not on her account yet dealing with a proper community. No, in order to have community, there has to be what she calls an inner bond, a feeling of togetherness, or some kind of reciprocal unification. As you, again, quoting from her, her text, only with their inner bond, with that feeling of togetherness, even if, if loose and limited, is a social formation transformed into a community. So again, to be a community member, there has to be this feeling of togetherness. And what does that amount to? Or what does that allow for? Well, it precisely allows for me to have experiences that are felt as ours rather than simply as mine plus yours. 
Now, again, one obvious question to ask is how is that unification coming about? And here, uh, Walter is basically suggesting that she's building upon earlier, the contribution of earlier phenomenologies. She's building on the exploration of empathy found in Scheele and Stein. And she ultimately ends up with a fairly kind of complex account saying that there has to be a kind of interlocked types of empathy going on between the community members in order to allow for this, uh, uh, you know, we feeling to occur. Now, one other aspect of interest in Walzer's uh, dissertation is that she actually distinguishes between different types of community. So she's not just making a distinction between uh, uh, society and community, she also distinguishes between different types of communities. On the one hand, there is what she calls personal communities, where one, one can uh, constitute community with people that one knows in person, that with, with people that one is directly interacting with. But she also argues that there are other types of communities that we need to recognize. And here she talks about objectual communities. So this is communities that are not based on direct interaction, but where certain conventions or rituals or goals is what kind of constitutes the, um, the kind of unifying uh, structure. And, and perhaps the most obvious example, and this is also an example mentioned by Walter, would be a religious community. So if I'm kind of if I convert to a new religion, I might feel, you know, a, a feel a, an inner connection with other uh, uh, believers belonging to the same community, even though I might not know all of them in person and might not might never be in a position to meet all of them. And so, what I think we find here is basically a distinction again between a more, uh, you know, a smaller type of community based on direct interaction and a more anonymous form of community uh, that is kind of structured by kind of shared conventions. And I think that to some extent um, uh, maps onto a distinction that Tomasello has recently made between a dyadic form of joint intentionality in the here and now between, you know, people that know each other and a kind of larger, more anonymous form of collective intentionality that draws on conventions and norms and institutions. I think the important point here is to realize that there are different forms of communities. Okay, at this point, let me return to Husserl, because even though I kind of launched uh, my talk by briefly referring to his discussion of empathy, I mean, he as well did not just stay there. I mean, he, he was not just focusing on on dyadic relationships, but moved on to also explore what might be needed in order to talk about larger uh, group formations. And as I'm sure you all know, I mean, one of the difficulties with kind of engaging with Husserl is that he's really, I mean, he has written so much and it's occasionally kind of difficult to really know where to look for the relevant passages. But I think in this specific case, there are actually two relatively short texts about 20 to 30 pages each, where, where I think one can find a lot of interesting ideas. And so the two texts that I will primarily be drawing on now is called Gemeingeist Ein from 1921 and from Gita Mitteilungsgemeinschaft from 1932. So the starting point for Husserl's investigation here concerns the nature of social acts. And what is a social act? And Husserl says, you know, if I imitate another, if I love another, if I hate another, or even if I empathically grasp another, these are not examples of social acts. This might, of course, sound a little bit strange. Why shouldn't, you know, love be a social act? But Husserl here basically uh, draws on an investigation that Reinach was uh, proposing uh, a bit earlier, where Reinhardt argues that, for, that a social act is a specific type of intentional act. It's an intentional act that requires an uptake. What does that mean? It basically means that the recipient of the act needs to be aware of it and needs to apprehend that somebody is kind of addressing him or her. So I can love somebody without that person ever knowing of my love 
But if I'm informing somebody, I mean, I wouldn't be informing somebody unless that person was kind of, you know, uh, uh, realizing it. So, you know, inf informing somebody would be a social act. And so what Husserl is now interested in is to explore what happens when I address another and when the author is aware that he or she is being addressed and when then that person reciprocates. And Husserl talks about, uh, he then introduces this notion of, you know, wechselseitig uh, einfühlung, reciprocal empathy, where both parties are mutually aware of being attended to by the other. And one of the important points then is that when that happens, I am not just aware of the author. If I'm standing in a reciprocal uh, relation of empathy with somebody else, I'm also aware myself of, be, of being attended to or addressed by the author. And here's what Husserl says. This is from actually a, 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 a different uh, text. In this situation, I experience my counterpart as being experiential directed at myself. And on the basis of this most fundamental form of being there for one another reciprocally, the most disparate I thou acts and we acts become possible. So it seems pretty clear that Husserl wants to say that we acts or we intentionality or collective intentionality somehow presupposes reciprocal forms of empathy as their kind of starting point. And we need to investigate a little bit further why, I mean, why that, why is Husserl arguing like that? Here's another quote from him where he says, when I'm standing in this kind of reciprocal relationship, I'm not merely for myself and the other is not merely standing opposed to me as an author, rather the other is my you. And speaking, listening, responding, we form a we that is unified and communalized. So what Husserl seems to be suggesting here is that, that somehow, you know, the, 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 the second person singular, the you, somehow seems to have a certain, uh, you know, important function in, in order to allow for something like uh, uh, we, we intentionality. But what is the relationship between relating to the other as a you and adopting a we perspective? Or as I said a moment ago, what is the relationship between the second person singular and the first person plural? Now, as I already kind of suggested, I think what is distinctive about relating to the other as a you is that when you do that, you are relating to somebody who is simultaneously relating to yourself as a you. Whereas I can relate to somebody as a he or she without that somebody realizing that I am currently addressing him or her. If I'm relating to somebody as a you, there has to be that uh, 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 reciprocity. And so one way to put that is to say that there cannot be just one you, there has to be at least two. So to adopt a second person perspective is to engage in a subject-subject relation where I'm aware of the other and as, at the same time, implicitly aware of myself as also being addressed as a you by the author. And Husserl then argues, and this I think is the kind of, in, kind of important point, He's, he then argues that when I'm implicitly aware of being addressed by the author, this is going to transform or change or modify my own self-experience. And he talks about that as a, it's kind of a, a bit surprising, because he talks about that as involving a self-alienation, a selbstentfremdung, somehow, he seems to be suggesting that when I'm standing in this reciprocal relationship, it's going to affect and change my own self-experience. And again, that's and, and again the argument seems to be that that has to happen if I am to be able to, to adopt a we perspective, if I am to be able to experience myself as one of us. Again, you might be thinking, I mean, what exactly is the argument here? And here I think it might be useful to just take a quick look at uh, social psychology and specifically, uh, uh, you know, Turner's uh, self-categorization theory. 
So the, the question that Turner was trying to address here was basically the question of how do you group identify? How do you come to see yourself as one of us? And Turner was arguing that in order for me to do that, what has to happen is that uh, there has to occur what he, uh, what he calls uh, uh, depersonalization or de-individualization, which all sounds perhaps a little bit uh, you know, negative, but, but, but I think the main point is simply the following. If I am to group identify and experience myself or think of myself as one of us, I have to minimize and uh, de-emphasize the difference between us. And I have to highlight whatever is shared between us. So that's what he means by depersonalization. I mean, I, you know, anybody who has been working on psychopathology will know that psychiatrists are talking about depersonalization in a very different way. But in social psychology, depersonalization really means this, this thing about, again, diminishing or de-emphasizing individual differences and kind of looking at and highlighting what is common uh, among us. And so I think that the idea here that uh, I think if we kind of keep that insight from social psychology in mind, it might be easier to understand what it is that Husserl is, is kind of uh, going on about. What he basically, I think, is saying is that in order to have a we perspective, in order to experience oneself as part of a we, in order to have, you know, feel and experience not simply as my own, but as ours, what we need here is a certain specific type of relationship to others. It has to be a relationship to others where the difference between us is not eliminated because if the difference between us were eliminated, it, it couldn't give rise to a we experience because you know a we is a second is a is a first person plural, so there has to be a preservation of plurality. There has to be difference. But the difference cannot be too uh, salient because that would also kind of block my capacity to identify with the author. So as people, some, as it has occasionally been put, the interpersonal differences has to be bridged rather than erased. There has to be difference, but it should not be too salient. And I think the, the, the solution here is that I need to think of myself as being more like others and how can I come to have that kind of experience? Well, I can come to have that kind of experience by incorporating the perspective that others have on me. So rather than experiencing myself as a completely unique, uh, uh, you know, irreplaceable subject, I, I start to experience myself as being like others, as also being, you know, a you like the you that I'm addressing. And I think that's why Husserl would talk about this selbstentfremdung that occurs as a result of uh, reciprocal empathy. That's why he wants to claim that that plays an important role in order to allow for something like uh, collective intentionality. Okay, just one more thing about Husserl. He actually goes on to say that having this kind of reciprocal relationship is not really sufficient. It's necessary, but it's not sufficient because there's also another requirement that has to be in place and that's the second personal address. And so here's a quote from, from the 1932 article. What is still missing, I mean, if, if one simply has reciprocal empathy, what is still missing is the intention and will to intimate the specific act of communication, the community creating act that in Latin is simply called communicatio. So I think the point that Husserl is making is the following. I mean, we, we might imagine a limit situation where I'm simply standing looking into the eye of the author and vice versa, but we're not expressing anything. We're just standing there looking into each other's eyes. And what Husserl would say is, in that case, there's not yet a proper eye-thou relation, because in order for that to happen, there has to be some kind of attempt to motivate or influence the author and Likewise, the author has to somehow 
reciprocate and, and try to influence me. But, it, but the moment that kind of interaction starts to happen, Husserl would say, then we have, you know, yet another important uh, element that, that is needed for something like collective intentionality to occur. So actually, you know, dialogue, communication is also for Husserl absolutely crucial for something like, uh, you know, the, the constitution of a, of a community. Now, so far, I've kind of basically been been guiding you through a very quick survey of a specific uh, uh, tradition within phenomenology, a tradition that argues that if we want to understand community, uh, if we want to understand the, the constitution of you know, large scale uh, group formations, you know, empathy and face-to-face -face relationships plays an absolutely crucial role. The point is then simply that that is not the only proposal to be found in phenomenology because there's also another kind of tradition uh, that, that basically says something very different. And let me just, I, I want to kind of present two figures from that other kind of approach. And let me start by, by uh, Gervich, since Gervich explicitly uh, in his book, uh, Targets, in the, in the book called uh, Die Mitmenschlichen Begegnung in der Milieuwelt. It was basically uh, Gervich's uh, habilitation, uh, but he had to leave Germany, uh, uh, he had to flee Germany before he was able to defend it, and it was only published many years uh, later. But in that uh, book, uh, Gervich explicitly targets uh, uh, Gerda Walter's uh, uh, approach, and it would be kind of informative to take a quick look at his reservations uh, against her proposal. So Gervich also kind of takes up this distinction between society and uh, community. He, he talks about, you know, partnership versus uh, uh, you know, communal membership, and says partnership is this kind of instrumental, strategic, you know, way of engaging with others, and that has to be contrasted to you know community where there is a certain warmth and mutuality and solidarity and then uh, he, then he explicitly asks okay how do we what is the main difference between these two types of group formations is the main difference as uh, Walter seemed to suggest uh, that there is a certain feeling of, of togetherness in the case of community that is lacking uh, when we are simply dealing with an association or a, a society. Is the, is the only difference between these two group formations the fact that community has this extra emotional dimension? Uh, and Gervich basically says this is not true. Uh, and the, uh, one of the arguments he, he puts forth is that a lot of communities might actually be you know, pervaded by all kinds of conflicts and feuds. There might be a lot of negative emotionality, but that doesn't make them any less community-based. And I guess perhaps one kind of a small example of that might be, you know, problematic family relations. I mean, it's not always the case that one's relationship to one's family is, is totally characterized by positive uh, emotions, but even if there might be a lot of tension, I mean, that doesn't change the fact that one's connection with these other family members are very different from, say, one's connection to strategic business partners, for instance. And Gervich then argues that rather than looking at positive emotions, what we should really be looking at if we want to understand a community is uh, the presence of shared traditions. Because whereas partnerships can be voluntarily initiated and discontinued, uh, communal memberships are basically beyond personal will and decision. So you are basically born into a specific community and what really constitutes the essence of that community is a certain historicity or a certain shared tradition. And I think, I mean, the main example here is probably, you know, the small village. Uh, and I mean, that might also kind of illustrate the limitation of, of Gervich's model, because one, and I find, I've always found that very puzzling, one type of community that doesn't really fit this uh, 
proposal uh, is is friendship. I mean, what about you know a small group of friends? Supposedly, that is something that you can voluntarily initiate, and you can also discontinue it. Uh, but that doesn't really seem to fit very well uh, his way of kind of stratifying uh, these group formations. But that's that's just a side remark. I mean, the, mo the main point that I want to make now is just this idea that the essence of community is shared tradition. It's not empathy as a specific type of reciprocal interaction with you know concrete authors. And that argument, of course, is brought even more forcefully uh, uh, forth in uh, in Heidegger, who is I mean much more well known in his attack at, at empathy. So let me just give you a, a few quotes. I mean, and I'm almost, I mean, reaching my, the conclusion of my talk now. So here are a few quotes from Heidegger's, uh, I mean, lectures from the end of the 20s. And it's obvious that he's here kind of criticizing the kind of empathy line that I have kind of been talking about. If this word empathy is at all to retain a signification, then only because of the assumption that the I is at first in its ego sphere and must then subsequently enter the sphere of another. But the I does not first break out since it already is outside, nor does it break into the other since it already encounters the other outside. And I think in order to understand that criticism, and you have to recall the German term Einfühlung. I mean, the idea here, I mean, it seems to, I mean, it seems to be, there seems to be this idea that if, if Einfühlung is what connects us, well, then I have somehow to feel my way into the author. And what Heidegger is basically saying, this is not what sociality is all about. Sociality is about, you know, shared projects in a common world. It's not about me trying to figure out how you are emotionally responding in your kind of subjective interiority. So Heidegger goes on to say, you know, empathy is not what really constitutes our being together. Rather, it's the other way around. Your know, mid sign is the precondition for empathy. And he also says that the Idao relation is not fundamental. Rather, there can only be an Idao relation because we are already fundamentally characterized by our being with one another. And so, st stepping on from this kind of criticism of, uh, of empathy as the kind of crucial uh, you know, building block. Heidegger will later on in lectures from the, uh, the, the mid 30s, and here I'm referring to a specific uh, a lecture called Logik als die Frage nach dem Wesen der Sprache. Uh, Heidegger then asks this question, well, who are we? And he proceeds to argue that as long as we think of the we as a plurality, as a plurality of individuals, we won't have any prospect of getting to understand what a proper community is. Rather, we need to realize that the community has a certain uh, primacy vis-a-vis -vis independent subjects. He talks about how it's our participation in that community that allows us to start experiencing ourselves as individuals. And whether or not we are a member of that community is not really up to us. It's something that is already decided based on our history and descent. And of course, it's not hard to, I mean, uh, it's not hard to, uh, or it's, it's hard to forget uh, that, of course, Heidegger was arguing like this when he was giving lectures in in, I mean, in, in, in Germany in the 30s. So there's, of course, a political context to this uh, approach as well. Okay, so to, to kind of wrap up, I mean, if one looks at, I think, the phenomenological contributions, I think one will quickly realize that there's much more going on in the phenomenological texts than merely a question of, you know, how can we, say, go for a walk together and how can we, you know, make food together? What we also found explored by the phenomenologists are not just you know, investigation of collective action, but also collective emotion, perceptions, preferences, et cetera. And I think more generally speaking, I think what we also find is precisely an attempt by the phenomenologists to not just look at collective intentionality on its own, but to try to relate that to an exploration of not just uh, social cognition or interpersonal understanding, 
but also at different types of self-understanding. So it's really an attempt to link explorations of the self, explorations of interpersonal understanding, and explorations of different types of collective intentionality. And the main point then is really again to just you know, make it clear to you that there is a very important tension to be found within phenomenology because there is a clear disagreement about what constitutes you know, the foundations of sociality. Is it the face-to-face -face encounter, the I Tao relation, the you know, anti-corporeity, is it that kind of relation? Or is there you know, a more basic, and this would be Heidegger's take, I think, a priori ontological sense of weeness. I mean, what has priority here? Another way of putting it is to use uh, Sartre's terms. Is it, you know, being for or being with that is most fundamental? And I'm, of course, Sartre would say it's, it's being for. And actually Sartre, I mean, you know, because, because, because I, I mean, I've kind of been basically been presenting you with, you know, first empathy theorists, and then we have Gervish and Heidegger in the 30s starting to criticize that approach. But of course it didn't end there because if we then move on to the 40s, Sartre will again start criticizing Heidegger, arguing that he's missing out on what really is important for a proper understanding of intersubjectivity, namely the encounter with radical otherness. And of course, later on, Levinas would equally start criticizing Heidegger, again arguing that Heidegger's approach doesn't really do justice to uh, the, uh, uh, the otherness of, of the author. And I mean, that discussion concerning what has primacy being for or being with is a discussion that is still ongoing uh, among uh, phenomenologists. And then what could one conclude? I mean, it's not obvious, I think, that one should accept what Searle at one point argued, namely that the phenomenologists do not have much to contribute to the topics of the logical structure of intentionality or the logical structure of social and institutional reality. I think when he made that verdict, I think he was just displaying his own ignorance about that whole uh, tradition. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you so much, Dan, for uh, this presentation. I have lots of questions, but I'm sure many other people do as well. Uh, who would like to start? Um, Pierre, you should um, unmute. Open your mic. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Fantastic. And we will speak about that for long, I imagine, now in the morning. Uh, just a, a quick remark. Someone who's been um, uh, been uh, given certain attention recently, uh, maybe because he's still alive and, and kicking, uh, is Hermann Schmitz. Mm -hmm. What is your reactions to to Hermann Schmitz's um, atmospheric take on this? Yeah. Well, um, you know, um, I mean, I mean, Hermann Schmitz, of course. I mean, you know, he's the proponent of the the new phenomenology, and I mean, sometimes when we're wondering what exactly is new phenomenology, and I think it's primarily Hermann Schmitz that's new, <laughs> and and then all his disciples as followers. I mean, so I guess um, I mean um, I mean there has of course been this. You know, a, a lot of people are talking about atmospheres, uh, and perhaps this is my ignorance, but I, I have occasionally had a hard time fully understanding why atmospheres are supposed to be something very different from stimmungen and moods. Why, I mean, why do we really need yet another fundamental category? And I mean, it might be my lack of familiarity with the more specific arguments, but I, I've just had a, a bit of a hard time uh, fully understanding it. Um, uh, and yeah, I mean, you know, and, and I guess, I guess, I mean, I guess, I mean, if I if I'm kind of getting it tr correctly, I mean, of course, he would somehow say that, you know, for for instance, you know, a cathedral might have a certain atmosphere, and uh, 
perhaps a, a forest might have another atmosphere and that that somehow also has to do not just with humanly imposed emotions, but it's also about, you know, giving a certain thing back to, you know, reality. But, but, but if we, for instance, takes, you know, the, the case of the forest, and if we were to say, okay, there might be, you know, a certain emotional dimension here that cannot be fully captured by, by neither moods nor intentional emotions, I guess my, my re reply question would be, okay, assuming that we grant that, but why should that then be of particular importance if you want to understand communal being together? Because I don't think you can get it both ways. I mean, either we should talk about community, which surely is something specifically social among humans, or we are talking about, you know, nature displaying certain conditions. But I mean, then we are not really talking about the community anymore. So, so I'm not sure that, I mean, just looking at atmosphere, that that that, that, that should somehow quickly change or fundamentally reorient our our way of understanding you know what is what is a community i, I hope that somehow I, I i don't think i can say much more than that. he's he's very focused on the architectural and the artificial and, and and things like that maybe he's a shortcut to phenomenology maybe he's a dead end i don't know yeah well, well i guess the important question would be how much noise from would be there will be when when he's no longer among us uh, you know yeah <laughs> I'm, I'm curious, if I may, if I may ask you, once you mentioned uh, Margaret Gilbert, if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. and her approach of uh, Mariology mm -hmm. and how she um, constitutes uh, groups. Mm -hmm. First, I think uh, very truly you insisted on the problem of always using a dyadic um, model initially uh, to describe a, a group, a Mariology, because a group is quite in its essence different from two people mm -hmm. and I wondered um, if you think it, it's not in a sense in the model she uses she says first you can walk together have a walk together then um, commitments become stronger they may, may they help you achieve bigger goals so how do you think you could like phenomenology could help us represent these complex goals for larger groups than two in an yeah. efficient way. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, but I guess, I mean, um, uh, so, I, so I, I, I have worked on, on Gilbert, but I think my uh, initial uh, take on her would, 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 would not, be, because, because I guess one question to ask would be, if we are talking about kind of more institutionalized forms of community, to what extent can her account really, which, which really seems to to take its point of departure and something very kind of, you know, pedestrian, like going for a walk, to what extent can that really illuminate those larger formations? And of course, I think she would want to make that claim. But, but I think my phenomenological uh, take would be, um, would rather be looking at what might go on, not above her example, but rather beneath it. Because, because for her, in order to have that kind of commitment that for her is crucial in order to allow for collective intentionality, there has to be, you know, normativity, there has be, to be commitment, there has to be a certain understanding of, of beliefs, which are all fairly cognitively complicated uh, 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 kind of elements. And I mean, one obvious question to ask is, you know, what about what developmental psychology is teaching us. I mean, what about more primitive forms of affective being with one another? And does that emotional sharing, which doesn't really, I mean, Gilbert does try to address it, but I think in a very strange way, what about emotional, you know, uh, sharing, which as I also said, you know, Sheila is specifically talking about, is that not an element that has somehow to be given a bigger role in, 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 in an account. So this would be one, I think, criticism. And another criticism would be that on Gilbert's account, it still seems to be the case that, you know, there are a number of individuals and then they decide somehow to start, you know, committing themselves to certain, you know, common goals. And, and, I, and I think what is a bit lacking in her account is the extent to which that, um, joining forces with others doesn't just leave the individual as he or she was at the beginning, but it actually starts transforming and modifying and enriching 
you know, our personal identity. And I think this is also something that I think the feminologists have kind of been focusing on. So I think that would be kind of primarily what I, what I would have to say. Great, thank you so much. Yeah, I agree. Uh, are there other questions from the, the crowd, the assembly? <laughs> Um, may I? Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah, I wanted to say, first of all, thank you so much for, uh, for all of these concepts. And it, I found it incredibly rich and just an animation in, in such a small period. So I, f I found that very, very enriching. And I wanted to ask about a particular um, two distinctions that, that you had made, uh, one for, for a large part of the talk between this sense of uh, immediate being together, a kind of experiencing the other in this immediate joint way, and then this reliance on some external material support, like an object, or uh, and, and this uh, distinction, um, to to me, uh, to what extent that represented a sort of a, a limit to the immediate phenomenal experience as a basis for community, and the need for some external or objective basis for community, and the relation between that distinction on the one hand, and the second distinction you made in the end. Uh, with Heidegger, mm -hmm. that uh, the immediate experience of each other has to be limited by this this Einfühlung, this pre-individuated mm -hmm. communal experience mm -hmm. uh, that precedes the individual. And I was wondering, are those two distinctions, do they amount to the same thing, or are they two separate kinds of distinctions? Um, and this Heideggerian aspect, does that also provide a kind of limit to the uh, phenomenological uh, or is that just another form of the phenomenological? Right, right. Yeah, okay, so, so uh, I mean, I guess one thing that, that, uh, that I didn't really say uh, clearly enough is, uh, is the following. Perhaps we should not look at, you know, the empathic approach and the, and the approach, you know, favored by Gervich and Heidegger really as alternatives we have to choose between. Because I think they are really... Both of them are illuminating things that I think are very important. And I don't think that one could come up with a convincing account of you know, sociality if one were only looking at the immediate intercorporal you know, being together. I mean, surely the role of tradition, historicity, shared rituals, I mean, all of that, of course, is important. And I, and I think especially if one is, is looking at what could be called, you know, uh, transgenerational communities, communities that that really persists over the lifetime of a single individual. I mean, we cannot, I think, understand that kind of you know uh, community unless we we kind of appeal to other things than uh, than 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 empathy. So so again, first of all, I think we need both. Uh, but then one could ask uh, whether what Heidegger is talking about, I mean, whether that is precisely the same as, say, uh, Walter was talking about. And I don't really think so, because for Walter, at least as I understand her, I mean, um, uh, uh, the empathic approach, uh, the, uh, the immediate interaction is really a kind of stepping stone for, for the objectual forms. Whereas I think Heidegger would say uh, the empathic, direct, you know, embodied interaction really has a different ontological precondition. So, so, so they, they are certainly in disagreement about the, the primacy of these two things. Um, and I think, I mean, again, I think also, I mean, I, I'm aware of the fact that, that time is running out. So I'm trying to, to, uh, to be quick here. Uh, you know, so first of all, I think it's important also not to say that the phenomenological contribution is, is just about the interpersonal relation. I mean, I think phenomenology has a lot to say about a, a lot of other things as well. And so here's just one, I think, yet another, I think, important distinction. Consider the difference between sharing an emotion with somebody in the here and now. I mean, that's one kind of collective phenomenon which I think is very different from, say, me being uh, upset because of my group membership. So let's assume that I'm, I've just converted to a new religion, then I read in the newspaper that other members of that religion has been persecuted somewhere else in the world, and this gives rise to distress in me, a distress that I wouldn't have felt were it not for the fact that I'm identifying as a group member. 
this is also a kind of collective phenomenon, but I think it's a very different one than the one that takes place, you know, synch synchronous with another person that I'm kind of, I mean, bodily interacting with. So again, there's a lot of distinctions that we need somehow to, to factor into to our account. Thank you so much, Dan. And thank you everyone for a fascinating discussion. And I hope we go back with the cases we are about to present on these dimensions and maybe learn a little bit about, about it. And uh, thank you again. Um, we, thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Uh, bye bye. Uh, I, um, if uh, for the people who are here, yes, <laughs> for the people here, um, if you want to uh, follow the workshops, you have to follow a different link, right, Francois? Could you tell us how it works? Yes, yes, 